بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه الطاهرين ما دام ما في السماوات والأرضين يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم تنزيله كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر صدق الله العظيم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم إنا نسألك علما ينفعنا ويرفعنا اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ورزقا واسعا وعملا متقبلا وشفاء من كل داء وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته If you are surprised to see me, I cannot really explain how is it that I get standing here, but Alhamdulillah, uh, be it as it may. Uh, this particular topic is a very, very important topic. The topic of uh, leadership, the topic of uh, vision, and the topic of creativity. From the outset, uh, we ask ourselves the question, are we leaders? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in various places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this question. And there are many verses in this particular regard. But I would like to start off with the following verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the angels and he says to them that I am going to place a khalifa, I am going to place a vicegerent on the face of the earth. And then the angels, they object to this and they say, أَتَجَعَلُ فِيهَا مَا يُفْسِدُ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ Are you going to place a species, are you going to place man on the face of the earth? And they are going to cause mischief and they're going to cause bloodshed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers and says, I know better than what you know. The important part of this particular verse which I'd like to highlight is simply the word khalifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us his khulafa, his vicegerents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us leaders on the face of the earth. Many other verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed you and me, Allah has placed us on the top of the food chain, for lack of a better phrase. Allah has subjugated everything else to us. Allah has made everything else subservient to us. Now this is an important point. And in order to drive that particular point, I'd like to go to another issue. Allah has made us the khulafa. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the shaitan, the devil, he has made it our enemy. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the shaitan the enemy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped him as well. So, when Allah commanded the shaitan to prostrate in front of Adam, he refused. And an interesting point in that particular regard is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it and Allah says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Why did Allah command, why did Allah command shaitan to fall prostrate in front of Adam? Allah says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ When I created him, not at that point. Allah goes on and he says, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ when I placed my ruh within him, at that juncture, after Allah had fashioned this human being, Allah didn't command shaitan to make sajda to him. It is only after Allah had placed the ruh within insan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands everyone, the malaika, including shaitan, 
to fall prostrate in front of Adam. So therefore the value of insan is not linked to his physical body, but rather the value of insan is linked to his ruh. Alayka bir ruh, some of us scholars say, fastakmil fadailaha, that you should look after your soul and you should endeavor to complete its virtue, the virtue of your soul. فَإِنَّكَ بِالْرُوحِ لَا بِالْجَسَدِ إِنسَانُ Because on what basis are you a human being? On what basis are you insan? You are insan not on the basis of your body, but you are insan on the basis of your, of your ruh. So once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done this, Allah created Adam, Allah placed a soul within him, Allah commands the devil to fall prostrate in front of him, the devil refuses and says, أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْ That I am better than, than him. I've been created from fire and he was created from clay. Fire is better than clay. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abolishes the devil. But before shaitan is expelled from the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to equip him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's our enemy, he's not an enemy that you can just walk over. He is a formidable enemy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equips him. And in Surah Bani Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions certain of the facilities which Allah has granted to the devil. One of the first weapons in terms of the chronological order of this particular verse that the devil has against us is Cause them to move as a result of what? As a result of your voice. Our scholars say that refers to music. So music is one of the weapons that the shaitan uses to take us off from the side path. And secondly, it's not shaitan alone. Shaitan has an army. And since we are likening to an army, his army has cavalrymen and it has you know, infantry, foot soldiers. And then Allah goes, continues and he says, And become their partners in the children, in other words, in the upbringing of the children, and become their partners in terms of their wealth. وَعِدُهُمْ And make them promises. وَمَا يَعِدُهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا The promises of shaitan are not but a deception. وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ Allah made you a promise, that was a good promise. I promised you, I broke my promise. So the point behind this entire discussion is that shaitan is our enemy. And Allah has equipped him with what has just been mentioned in these verses. So therefore he becomes a formidable enemy. In the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you and me, as the verse clearly says, Khalifa. Allah has made you and me his vicegerents. Allah has made us his representatives on the face of the earth. And like Allah has equipped shaitan to be a formidable enemy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped you and me to be that khulafa which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has envisaged us to be. So you find that Allah has given shaitan certain qualities. What qualities has Allah given us? If you wanted to, you could say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you and me with divine qualities, with God-like qualities. Allah made us the khalifa. He is Al-Alim, he is most knowledgeable. Allah has blessed you and me with the knowledge of, with, the, with this quality of ilm. It's a divine quality. When Allah has made us the Khalifa, Allah is Al-Qadir. Allah is most powerful. Allah is all powerful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this ability of Qudra, of power. Allah is Al-Mudabbir, which Malna Khalil has referred to in terms of systems and so forth. Allah is Al-Mudabbir. Allah is the one who makes tadbir. Allah is the one who plans. And like that, He has granted you and me the ability to plan as well, to make tadbir. At this particular juncture, the English saying comes to mind that power corrupts, and ultimate power corrupts ultimately. 
So these qualities which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us to serve as the khulafa, we need to use these qualities as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to use these qualities. And we must use it for that role which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has envisaged for us. And that is the role of leadership. So I come back to the same question. Allah has made us leaders. Allah has granted us the qualities whereby we can become just leaders on the face of the earth. And Allah says in another verse which I've quoted right at the beginning, Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhijat linnas. You are the best of people that have been taken out for the benefit of mankind. Now, Umar radiallahu an says that you are only the best of nations, that if you fulfill the requirements and the conditions mentioned in these verses, and what are they? Ta'muruna bil ma'aruf wa tanhawna anil munkar. You call to us good and you forbid from the evil. So when do you find yourself in a position when you are able to call towards good and you're able to forbid from evil? You're only in that position if you are a leader. If you're not a leader, then you don't have the license to make amr bil ma'aruf wa nahin munkar. So therefore this verse implicitly implies that we are meant to be the leaders of, of nations. And we find this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the greatest khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of the earth. You find that the companions, when they would refer to themselves, they refer to themselves as Rasulu Rasulillah, the messenger of the messenger of Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the ultimate khalifa, he's the ultimate leader. And we follow in his footsteps as leaders of the entire, not only Muslim community, but the entire, entire mankind. And when we look at leadership, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi being the greatest leader, and like Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, and this verse we're very familiar with, لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ That verily for you, in the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or in the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's a good example. Not only in one aspect of our lives, but in every aspect of our lives. And here in particular, what were the leadership qualities of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And because of this leadership qualities, he was able to create this group of people, this group of individuals whom we refer to as the Sahaba, our leading and our guiding stars. What were the qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that resulted in this creation of what we refer to as the as the Sahaba. The first, there are many verses in this particular regard. The first verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Verily has come to you a messenger from amongst yourselves. And what are his qualities? عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ عَزِيزٌ The word Aziz has a number of meanings. It can mean Izza means power also. Izza means honor also. Aziz, Qudra, power also. Aziz, difficult. Azizun alayhi. It is difficult upon him. What is difficult upon him? As the leader, what is difficult upon him? Ma anittum. Whatever difficulties that you experience. So you and I, as leaders of the Muslim community, do we have this quality? And in today's terms, in English terms, you would refer to this quality as empathy. Empathy means to feel for the next person. Do we feel for the next person? Do we feel for our Muslim brothers and sisters? Do we feel for our fellow leaders? Do we feel for our communities? If we don't have this quality, then we should take steps and try to imbibe this very important quality of empathy. حَرِيصُنَ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ So tied into this is حَرِيصُنَ عَلَيْكُمْ the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is desirous for you. What is he desirous for? He's desirous, he's desirous for your betterment, for your success, both in this world as well as in the year after. First quality, empathy. Number two, to desire success and to desire good for your fellow leaders and your fellow community. This in another, in another hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is expressed as nasiha, as nusr. The Prophet says, 
الدينو النصيحة this entire deen is based on what? النصيحة normally when we translate the word نصيحة we say advice but probably and Allah knows best a better translation for the word نصيحة would be goodwill to have the goodwill of the person at heart and as we know in terms of مصطلح الحديث that the rawi of the hadith the narrator of the hadith هو أدرى بما يروي he knows better what he is narrating so the narrating companion an incident happens to him and this particular incident will explain to us this quality of goodwill that you and I should have as leaders so on one occasion he sends a slave to purchase a horse in the marketplace so the slave goes out and he buys the horse for a bargain when he comes back the master wants to know the companion wants to know how much did you pay for the horse so he says the amount I don't recall the amount but let's call it 300 so that's a good deal I got a very good horse for a very good price so for me it's a very good deal but because this particular companion he has this quality of goodwill that he heard from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and he thinks to himself that it's a good deal for me but is it an equally good deal for the seller and he says no so what does he have at heart not only his own best interest not his own goodwill but the goodwill of the seller as well and then he sends his slave back and says increase him give him some more money and this happens one or two times and he ends up paying twice or thrice as much that he initially paid why what was the impetus what was he driven by he was driven by this important quality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu which you and I not only as leaders but as Muslims should have within us and this is the quality of of goodwill so at the end of the day he ends up paying much more why because he has the goodwill of the of the seller at heart as as well may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that particular particular quality so we've looked at a number of qualities now empathy number one number two the issue of the issue of goodwill having the goodwill of others at heart and then very importantly one of the qualities of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whatever difficulties you experience the Prophet ﷺ takes it to heart and it brings into one of the qualities that in modern times they, in, they, they term if you want to be a successful leader you need to give your community individualized attention so we find that the Prophet ﷺ, he was expert at doing this not only looking at the community at whole but he was in touch with the needs of every single individual of the community such a dynamic leader he was look one story comes to mind now is that you know what happens sometimes with us is that as leaders we have responsibilities out there so when we come home and then we say that you know you can't expect me to do mundane tasks you can't expect me to help around the house you can't expect me to do this that and the other but look at the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if even if you are the CEO of the company even if you are the greatest leader even if you are the president or the principal whatever of a given organization then your responsibility pales in comparison to the responsibility that of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he had the responsibility of irshad of guidance he had the responsibility of idai of the entire ummah on his shoulders but yes yet when he used to come home he used to help with the mundane task he used to help uh, with household chores. He used to mend his own clothing. He used to help milk the goats. So he was, he was in tune with the needs of every individual, even of those of his household. In relation to this, the community that he was faced with, we find there's a hadith of Amr ibn al-As. He says that because of the way that the Prophet sallallahu conducted himself with me as an individual I began thinking to myself that I am the most beloved person to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and his conduct with me was so was, 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 so, was so good and so consistent that I came to a point where I convinced myself that I'm the most beloved person to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and this conviction took me to such a stage that I said, I'm going to ask him now. That, O oh, Prophet of Allah, it must be. 
You know, the way you're conducting yourself with me, it must be that I'm the most beloved person to you. So then he asked the Prophet O oh Prophet of Allah, and he does a comparison in this particular narration, that am I more beloved to you or Abu Bakr radiallahu So we know the answer. And then Abu Ibn al says that, you know, after having asked the question, I said to myself, how I wish I had never ever asked the question. Because I did not ask the question, then for the rest of his life, he would have told himself, because of the way the Prophet ﷺ conducted himself, with him, he would have thought that I'm the most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. Now many times what happens to us as leaders, and look at the degree of success that the Prophet ﷺ achieved with, with his community. And whatever difficult community you and I may be working with, it cannot be more difficult than the community which the Prophet ﷺ was working with. It was very difficult. The complexities of that time is, 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 is way beyond the complexities that you and I experience day to day. But in that community, the Prophet ﷺ was able to give every single person individual attention. What about you and me? And because he gave them individual attention, the Prophet ﷺ was able to achieve the success that he did achieve. If you look at another, another incident, so this is now one companion. And what is this? Because whenever the Prophet ﷺ sees him, the Prophet greets him first. Uh, this is not that, you know, every single person in your community, you must give 15 minutes, you won't have time for yourself. No. Just your general conduct with your community and with your fellow leaders must be such. The Prophet ﷺ comes into a gathering, where does he sit? He sits right at the end. No problem. The Prophet ﷺ, he sees somebody, the Prophet ﷺ greets first. A lady comes to the Prophet ﷺ. And she, she wants counsel, she wants a session with the Prophet ﷺ. What does the Prophet ﷺ tell her? The Prophet ﷺ says, Ijlisi fi tariqatin min madina, ajlis indak. That you know, wherever you want to meet, in whichever of the alleys of Medina, you know, is most comfortable for you to sit in, I will come there and I will sit with you and I will meet you. This was the, this was the, the, the leadership qualities which the Prophet ﷺ possessed. And as a result, he was successful in terms of his mission. And for us, it's, it's, for us it's easy. The Prophet has blazed the path. All we have to do is follow in, follow in suit. And if you're not entirely convinced by this particular argument, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself mentions to us the key element to the success of the entire mission of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But before I mention that verse, you know, in the polemical discussions, in discussions with, 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 with the Shia by way of example, they say that after the demise of the Prophet wasallam, that most of his companions turned apostate when a'udhu billah. Only a handful of them remained firm to the Islam which the Prophet brought. So if you're saying that, that particular statement, does it negatively reflect on the companions? Before negatively reflecting on the companions, it negatively reflects on who? On none other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you are saying that the Prophet was not successful. And we believe that the Prophet was successful. And his success is measured by what? By these Sahaba which he left behind. Who in turn, as Mawlana Khalil quoted, they were responsible for expanding the borders of Islam from one ocean to another ocean. From one climate to another climate. From one continent to another continent. But what was the primary element in the success? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ That if you were harsh and your heart was hard, what would have happened? لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ They would have left you. You wouldn't be able to build those inroads into the hearts of the companions if you didn't have the right character. So the character of the Prophet was central to his entire mission, was central to his leadership. It was, it was the most salient feature of his entire makeup. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ If you want to measure this masjid, you need a tape measure. If you want to measure a liquid, you need volume. If you want to measure rice, you need a, 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 a scale. If you want to measure character, you measure it against the character of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say he had the best of character. You have character, then Allah talks about another level and he says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ You are above that level of high character, you are beyond that. 
May Allah grant us that. And as leaders, it's very important the way we conduct ourselves, ourselves with our community as a whole and how we conduct ourselves with our individual members. Sometimes we come into the masjid and there's not, the, 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 our, 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 our congregation don't know whether they can greet us or not. Because today, just the look on our face is enough to drive them away. This wasn't the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So in terms, of, in terms of leadership, there's a recipe for leadership. You have to have the nick to do the trick. And the nick here is, of everything else, is character. You need to have the, 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 the character of the greatest leader. And that is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And important, we find, in, one, could, one could really go on and on. You know, not, not myself, I can't go on and on. But you know, if you really talk about the, the, the ulama, and if you look at the seer of the Prophet ﷺ and the shamail of the Prophet ﷺ, you could see at different stages how atomistic things, individual things, that all leads up to this character of the Prophet ﷺ that made him the leader that he, that he, that he was. Now, another, another, another very important quality of the Prophet ﷺ as a leader was what our, what our contemporary academics, what they refer to as you know, this, this quality of transformational leadership. We want to be leaders, but how do you become that leader that your leadership actually affects and it creates that change within your communities? How do you become that? So, most of us, by and large, when we're dealing with our congregation, or we're dealing with our students, by and large, they are adults. Now, studies, contemporary studies have shown that when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with, with, with children, then children, they take on very easy to mandates, imperatives. Uh, sit, and then they're going to, going to sit. Stand, they're going to stand. Irrespective of what, what, what you do, they're just going to follow your command. But studies show that adults, they only follow when they are being led by example. You cannot tell an adult to do something and you do something else altogether. That's, that's not going to result in transformation and leadership. In other words, you must be the change that you want to see. And that was exactly the example of the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, his leadership was transformational. He actually influenced those people around him. They wanted to become like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And then his companions, we hear this all the time, that when they would come, they would come to certain places and they would say that become like us. They could make that statement. Why? Because they were leaders and they were transformational leaders. They led by example. And again, our books are filled with examples in this particular light. On one occasion, on one occasion, when the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, they were undergoing severe hunger. And the, 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 the companions, they complained to the Prophet ﷺ. And they had a stone tied to their belly. And then when they complained to the Prophet ﷺ, he lifted up his upper garment and they found not only one stone, but two stones tied to the belly of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. This is leading how? This is leading by way of, by way of example. On another occasion, Umar radiallahu an and Abu Bakr, these are all examples that we know of. They came out and what drove them out of the house at a time where generally in an Arab uh, setting you wouldn't be out of your house. That's siesta time. But they came out of the house. Why? Because of hunger. And when they came out, who did they find? They find the Prophet ﷺ. And the very thing that brought them out of their house was the thing that brought the Prophet ﷺ out of, out, out of his house. It was hunger. Again, the point is leading by example. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us, grant us that. Okay. Now, the, the, the other issue which, which, uh, about leadership, so leadership is all about imbibing the qualities that befit a leader. And may Allah grant us that qualities. The same qualities that the Prophet Muhammad had. The other, the other issue which, uh, which was mentioned in terms of the introduction was that a leader, he needs to have a vision. And again, when we look at vision and the, the, the scope of vision. You know, in English we say that, you know, if you aim for the, if you aim for the, you must aim for the stars. Because if you aim for the stars, at least you get to the lamp pole. But if you aim for the lamp pole, you're not going to get anywhere. So your vision must be a big vision. Right? And when we talk about a vision, right, we're really talking about an intention. That the intention must be a great intention. And nothing else is required from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only looks at your intention. 
Earlier on, Mulna Khalil was alluding to that, you know, we want to do so many things, but what happens is we say that we don't have money. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say that you have to make an intention and you have to have the money, then you will be successful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only says one thing, make an intention. So when we talk about vision, in an Islamic paradigm, an Islamic framework, what are we talking about? We're talking about making a good, sincere, and solid intention. And Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Saghuri, rahmatullah alayhi, I love to quote this uh, quote that he says. He says, if you have a vision, will that vision be realized? And for us, a vision is an intention. Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Saghuri says, never ever will a person who comes with a true intention, never ever will he be disappointed. Just the intention. So all Allah wants from you is for you to make the intention. Then when you make that sincere intention, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take charge of realizing that intention. Allah will make that intention become a, a reality. And the importance of intention, the, the intention is the most important part, not only at the beginning, but during the action. And ultimately at the end of the action also, the intention is the most important thing. Because when things start getting rough, the going start getting tough, what do you fall back on? There's only one thing you can fall back on, and that is your vision. And in our terms, that is your intention. That will give you the strength that you require. Because we can't expect that, you know, we're going to make intention, and then everything is going to be smooth sailing therefrom. And this particular regard, we must, as leaders in our community, we must visit the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will explain to us the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fil ard. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa started his mission, number one, when he started the da'wah, the da'wah was it sirran or jahran? Sirran for three years. Afterwards it became jahran. When it became jahran, was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met with opposition or not? The fact that he had to immigrate from Makkah to Medina tells you that there was so much opposition that the Prophet ﷺ, it was no longer tenable for him to stay in Makkah and he had to move to Medina. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made it easy. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us a lesson. And that is when we, when, we, when, I, when we set ourselves on that path of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, then like he met up with opposition, we're also going to meet up with opposition. And that is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-ard. If you become a Muslim, you can't just become a Muslim. You're going to be tested in, in establishing yourself as a leader, in doing work in your community, in taking your community forward. You're going to be faced with challenges and challenges and challenges. But the first time we're faced with a challenge, we tell ourselves, oh no, we got to down with tools. No. That challenge that you are facing is proof of the fact that you are on the right path. Because if, if, if challenges meant that you're on the wrong path, it means that the Prophet ﷺ was way off the path. The fact that you have challenges in, 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 after making your intention and having your vision, that is ample proof that you're on the right path. And when we are faced with these challenges, we should look to the seer of the Prophet ﷺ. A very important nukta, which, 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 uh, which, 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 how can we expect not to be challenged as leaders? After we've established our vision and we're walking on the path now. We haven't understood our, 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 the, the haqiqah of ourselves on this, on this ard. Dr. Ramadan al Buti beautifully explains it. And he says that, I don't know if he says the first part, but the, what are you, you insan? So how do you define insan? Insan is hayawan natik. That you are, what are you? You are a, a living entity that has an intellect. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you in charge of everything else. That's your that. The haqiqah of your that is that you are hayawan natik. And your first sifa is what sifa? You have a sifa. You have a sifa of being an abd. So Allah is the mawla and you the abd. So because Allah is the mawla and you the abd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes taklif, you the slave, Allah is the master, whatever the master tells you, you must do. That's why you become mukallaf, because you're a slave. So if you're a slave, what if you became a slave? Now you must make da'wah, and there's no difficulties. Then, what type of slave are you? You don't have to do nothing. You're a slave like a king. So we, we, when we understand our reality as ibad, and ibad are mukallafun, and mukallaf is taklif, and taklif ma fi kulfa. You go, there's going to be difficulties. 
It is only for us to shoulder those particular difficulties. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. So we must have this vision. And this vision must be a, a broad vision. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Makkah, two, just two occasions, and I'll move on to the next and we'll end off inshallah. In Makkah, when the Muslims came to the complain to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he tell them? Bal antum tasta'ajilun. You're being hasty. La Allahu hadha al-amr. Definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring this matter to completion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it successful. Number one. Second incident is at the battle of the trench, Khandaq. All the, the, the confederates that gathered outside of Medina, the intention is to completely annihilate the Prophet Sallallahu and any traces or semblance of Islam on the face of the earth. They said, now while, they, while they're digging the trench, there's a rock in the way. And the, the companions are struggling to, to break the rock. And they call to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what does he do? He takes the pick and he strikes the rock. The rock strikes. And what does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? The doors of the Persian Empire has been opened. Look at the vision. Look at the, look at, look at the condition where they are. But look at the vision of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's yaqeen that the word of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is going to come to fall. And then in, this, at the second strike, the, the Roman Empire has fallen to us. And when Umar becomes the Khalif, and then when this happens, he cries because he remembers the word of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we have that vision, that vision, we, it must be a broad vision. In, in Jama'a Dawud Tabliq, they say, Alami Fikr. You must have a concern, but your concern must be for the entire world. And that is the type of vision. We mustn't sell our short, ourselves short by having a limited vision. The sky is the limit. Not even the sky is the limit. And we look at the example of the Prophet The Prophet had visionary leadership. They, in, the, in the battle, the, 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 the confederates want to completely annihilate them. And what is his vision? He says that the doors of the Persian Empire and the doors of the Roman Empire are opening to us. The next issue which, uh, which, which we'll touch on very briefly inshallah is the issue of, of uh, innovation. I forget what the topic was now. Leadership? Creativity. So creativity and innovation. So here yeah, it's very important, this is a very important issue and I'd like to mention an English saying. When we look at creativity, what is the need for creativity and innovation? Right? What is the need for it? There's an English saying that goes, nothing fails, nothing fails like success. Nothing fails like success. Now let's look, let's take an example. Now let's say uh, uh, 20 years back. So what happened in terms of upbringing of children? So what happened in that particular setting? What happened was that if somebody did something wrong, they got a good hiding and it worked. 20 years later, when circumstances have definitely changed, when it comes to the upbringing of our children, can you tell me safely that, you know, it's just going to require hiding and the problem is solved? I don't think so. So what worked then is not necessarily going to work now. So this, this, we need to be as innovative as we possibly can. And where do we get this from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika. That call towards the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we know is an imperative. But what does the second part of the verse say? Bil hikmah with wisdom. Now when it comes to hikmah, the wisdom part, so one of our scholars very beautifully, they say here in this particular context, that wisdom means that you're able to call somebody, you're able to right the wrong while maintaining the relationship. That is hikmah. You know, when you, sometimes when you tell somebody who's doing something wrong, if you're going to tell him what the right thing is, you said what the right thing is, but that's the end of your relationship. But hikmah means that you're able to right the wrong while still maintaining the, the relationship. But if you take the look at the word hikmah and broader, so we must call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we must use hikmah. Hikmah in terms of my understanding Allah knows best is we must be creative and we must be innovative. If to a certain audience, you know, a talk is fine. But to another audience, you need to have a certain type of presentation where you're saying the same thing but just in a different way. If that is the hikmah, if that is what means وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَى الْبَلَاغِ We say وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَى الْبَلَاغِ What does that mean? That's our excuse to just take ourselves out of the equation. We don't have to do all the hard work. وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَى الْبَلَاغِ Ulama say is that you must make the message reach that person's heart, not his ear. 
So if balagh means that you need to just do a different, you need to just be creative in terms of the way that you present it, then we are fulfilling the law of Allah SWT where he says, ila rabbika bil, bil hikmah with wisdom. So whatever tools we have at our disposal in terms of conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should use and that is what we talk about when we talk about creativity and we talk about innovation in terms of so what is this need I'm, I was thinking about it what is this need for creativity and do we have an asal for it when I look at the concept of bay'ah and when I look at the concept of tajdeed what is bay'ah earlier on earlier on we, 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 we mentioned the hadith and what is the hadith the hadith the one one of the Compensis, Bayatu Rasul Salasam, Allah Ikama Ikamati Salah, Wa Ita Izaka, one Nis, one Nusli Muslimin. That um, I'm going to finish now. Nusli uh, Muslimin. So, last point, inshallah. So, what happened was, look, isn't, didn't Allah really command us in the Quran to make Ikamati Salah? Didn't Allah really command Ita Izaka? Wasn't there a hadith that really spoke about Nus, goodwill? So, what, 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 what is happening now? You have in tajdeed, just a renewal of that in a different format altogether. With this companion, he comes personally to the Prophet. He's got the general instruction from the Quran, but personally between him and the Prophet, they have this renewal. So, what is it? Same thing, different format. So, what we require in terms of, of, of working in our communities with the leadership qualities, with the vision that we have, we need to have creativity in terms of rolling things out. And a, a dalil shari'i for me and Allah SWT knows best for this is the fact that you have these mubaya'at. It is stuff which is already in the Quran, already in the hadith, but it's the same things done in a different format. So when we roll out our vision in the 21st century, we are operating in a different format altogether. Already, already, we are moving from, from, you know, like paperless studying, electronic books and so forth. So we, if we find ourselves in communities where that is the order of the day, then we need to have this degree of creativity in terms of rolling out. Because that's what Allah wants from us. Not only to call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but bil hikmah with that wisdom. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq, inshallah, to practice. Wa I must tell you also that um, I wasn't meant to, meant to, meant, meant to speak, but I, I really enjoyed the opportunity uh, uh, half an hour, 45 minutes before, just to put some notes down. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to teach you in different ways. I came here with the intention of sitting at the back and, you know, really just chilling out and listening to our ulama and our teachers. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had other plans for me and He wanted me today to learn something. So these notes that I put about, you know, in Urdu, I know you don't like the Urdu sayings too much, but they say that, you know, the lisan to choti hi lekin kalam to to barai. You know, it's the words of Allah and the words of His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we must, we must take this to heart. And listen to it, inshallah. And this must frame, uh, not, not my words, the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That must frame the way that we operate and conduct ourselves in our communities. So, wa'l'afu minkum wa'akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.